Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome to our first webinar of 2021, Healthy Grass, Happy Cow, Hearty Yield. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by my colleague, Philip Cosgrove, who many of you will be familiar with from previous webinars. Philip is Yara's Grassland Agronomist for Yara UK and Ireland. Our guest speaker this evening is Dr. Conrad Ferris, Principal Scientist in Sustainable Dairy Systems with AFBI, the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute in Northern Ireland. AFBI is a multidisciplinary organisation involved in high technology research and development, diagnostic and analytical testing for DARA public bodies and commercial companies in Northern Ireland and further afield. So you're very welcome, Conrad, and it's great to have you on board this evening. So this evening, Conrad will take us through the long-term changes in Northern Irish silage quality, limitations to improving silage quality on dairy farms, evaluating multi-cut silage systems for milk production and farm safety during milk, sorry, during silage making. Philip will cover fertilizer timings and considerations to improve nitrogen use efficiency and minimize losses and the fertilizer requirements of silage crops this spring. Then following the two presentations, then we're going to have a Q&A session. So if you would like to uh, ask a question, just scroll down your screen and you'll see then a box where you can input your question just below the webinar viewing screen. So Conrad, at this stage, I'll hand the reins over to you to take it up. Okay, Eva, uh, thank you very much for that introduction and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Eva, can I just check, are we at full screen here or have I to do something? No, you're okay, Conrad. So okay. yeah, you should, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, so it, it oh. should be displaying full screen to, to the audience. Perfect. Dead on. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, just as uh, Eva said, I work at the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute and we've got a number of sites uh, across Northern Ireland. The largest is our research farm at Affey Hillsborough. Uh, where we do research into beef, sheep, pigs, renewable energy and dairy. And you can see the photo from the air there with our dairy grazing area and our, some of our dairy buildings in behind. Uh, in terms of dairy research programmes, just very briefly, uh, highlighting some of our key areas. The environment is one of the big issues, uh, reducing phosphorus losses to water, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, methane, nitrous oxide, and very recently ammonia has become one of the key uh, environmental issues within the North. Uh, different re research on crossbreeding, different cow genotypes, Norwegian cows, uh, Jersey crosses Swedish red, winter feeding, one of my key research areas uh, in terms of concentrate feeding, concentrate allocation, and more recently looking at replacing soya with homegrown fetal beans. And then quite a lot of research from my colleagues involved in terms of precision agriculture, Precision, both in terms of nutrient application, grassland management, and winter feeding. And I guess the other uh, major area is, uh, oops, sorry, I think I've slipped on too far there. Uh, well, uh, is, is the whole area of grassland research, and we're part of, for those in GD, we're part of the Grass Check program. But one of the areas that I guess we haven't been heavily involved in in recent years is the whole issue of silage research. Uh, about 30 years ago, I did my PhD on silage production, and that was really a major focus of our research program back then. But probably the last 15, maybe even 20 years, really hasn't been a big issue. And probably, to be honest, the reason for that is we, we probably felt we knew pretty much everything there was about silage, and maybe wasn't a, a lot to still to do. But recently, we have re established a new silage research program. And really a number of reasons for that. Uh, firstly, if we want to control feed costs, well, there are a number of elements to control and feed costs in dairy farms. That's firstly, probably the most important one is make more efficient use of concentrates in terms of concentrate level and how we feed them. And the, the, the second key one is make more use of quality forage and uh, graze grass and grass silage are both extremely important there. Grass silage, certainly within the north and GB, maybe less so than the Republic of Ireland, uh, cows are increasingly being housed for longer and longer, and grass silage is becoming a more and more important part of the diet. So grass silage, absolutely critical if we want to control feed costs on our farms. 
The other real reason uh, we've started to go back to look at silage research is really the whole issue of has silage quality improved in recent years. And we certainly know that technology for silage making has improved very dramatically. But in terms of changes in grass silage quality, well, we, we've been fortunate to be able to analyse over 80,000 silage samples from Northern Ireland over the last 20 years in our lab at Hillsborough using NIRS. And that's given us a really good picture of just how silage quality has changed over that 20 year period. And unfortunately, the, the story isn't that positive. Uh, if we look at a couple of key nutrients here, firstly, dry matter. Well, you can see, I guess it is a good news story. Bob and dry matter has increased over the last 20 years. It's just you may not be able to see that, but that's a year along the bottom from 98 to 2017. So dry matter has probably increased by six or seven percent, which uh, I should say these are first cuts, and that is a good news story. But if we look at crude protein levels, uh, crude protein really hasn't improved at all. Uh, ammonia, which really reflects fermentation and how the protein is preserved, has not decreased. And probably most disappointing at all is the metabolizable energy content of the silage. And you can see from this, the ME content really hasn't changed over that 20 year period. Given that ME is a big driver, one of the big drivers of performance, that is certainly disappointing. I should sort of caveat this slide to the fact these are silages from dairy farms, beef farms, all, all silages we've analysed. We can't separate them out that easily. Uh, but certainly the key message is silage quality hasn't improved that much. Um, really, as we started this research program, we wanted to know what is preventing our farmers from making better quality silage. At the outset, we did a survey of 174 dairy farmers who were attending an open day up at Caffrey, up at the Agricultural College at Greenmount. Really, just to get some basic information on silage making practices and farmers' perceptions on what's really influencing silage quality on their farm. Uh, really what's limiting improvements. Uh, I'll just present a few results of that survey, firstly just some background of what's happening in, in the north in terms of silage making uh, systems. You can see that 75% of farmers are operating a three cut system and still maybe surprising to me 22% of farmers still operating a, a two cut silage system. 12% uh, of the farmers at the open day, and maybe they were slightly more progressive farmers, did they were operating a four cut system. I guess it wouldn't be maybe what I see in the ground, but uh, that was the audience we had on that day. Uh, in terms of how silage is harvested, you can see most 63% by self propelled, propelled harvest, it's really reflecting contractor use. Uh, but 12% by a forage wagon and still 7.5% of farmers using bales, presumably the smaller farmers. Uh, in terms of contractor use, 63% of farmers said they normally use a contractor. Only 12% of farmers said they never use a contractor to make silage on their farms. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of sort of the key silage making practices in the north. But in terms of really what is impacting silage quality and bear in mind this is farmers perceptions so we really identified a number of key what we believe to be key issues and asked farmers to rate those for how big an impact it was having on quality on their farm so the farmers were really rating each of these in terms of no effect some effect moderate effect large effect or very large and the figures you see here are the percentage of farmers that responded to both the two lines highlighted here in green uh, relate to weather issues, uh, delayed cutting due to poor weather, uh, poor ground conditions or delayed lifting due to weather issues. And within the survey overall, that was absolutely the, the biggest impact for farmers, weather, uh, delaying cutting, delaying lifting, delaying harvesting, and probably not a huge surprise there. And of course, there is only a limit to what we can do about the weather. But many of the other issues that came up with within the survey showed that some of these were really things that farmers could do things about. So there was just a work down through them. Uh, delaying cutting to allow herbage nitrogen levels to fall. Uh, not a huge impact, but certainly some farmers believing that was affecting silage quality. Contractor availability, uh, maybe was surprised there, but 40, uh, 60 or 65 percent of farmers said really very little impact of uh, contractor availability of those that use the contractor 
so that was positive that farmers were able to generally get the contractor when they wanted it. This one is one I'll come back to later on is delaying cutting to allow swords to bulk up and to reduce harvesting costs. And if you look at the last three col uh, columns there, moderate, large, very large effect, we're really saying that 35% of farmers were saying that, yeah, they were consciously, consciously making a decision to delay cutting, to allow their swords to bulk up a bit to try to reduce harvesting costs. So you can imagine the impact of that on silage quality. And that's one that I, I will come back to later on within my presentation. Um, the other slide here, just to not dwell too much on them, but again, summarizing some of the key issues, uh, some of which we're now looking at within a research program. Autumn grass, winter grass, grass that grows after the final cut is taken, that's then there in the following spring. And certainly a proportion of farmers feeling that was influenced on silage quality, although a lot of farmers were able to remove that with sheep or young stock. Uh, grass not being able to wilt for long enough, uh, again, quite a large impact and again, very much weather related, but also contractor related, just uh, contractors banging on the door really wanting to get their fields lifted. Uh, and maybe the grass just not where the farmer wanted it to be in terms of dry matter. And uh, the next two I'll sort of join together, uh, poor quality grass from con acre ground or rented ground and poor quality grass from own ground. And you can see a large percentage of farmers believed uh, that this was having a negative impact, especially from rented ground. And that probably reflects the short term rents that we have uh, in the north uh, quite often. And why improve a sward if you don't know you're going to have it uh, rented the next year. Two very practical ones. The next one, slurry residues being inspired with grass, soil contamination due to it being wrecked up, uh, certainly having an impact uh, on some farms. And the, the last two, again, very practical ones, uh, inadequate compaction because the silo is being filled too full and just not enough labour, very practical issues. All issues that farmers believe were influencing quality on their farms to some extent. So really one of the key things we asked in this survey was uh, for, uh, farmers' perception as whether they believed the silage made on their farm, the quality had improved over the last 10 years. And you can see here that a reasonable large number of farmers actually believe silage quality had improved, which probably does suggest maybe the, 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 the quality data put up earlier was impacted by beef farmers' data being there. But I think one of the key outcomes here was why, why did those farmers believe that there had been improvements? And 43 43% of farmers put that down to earlier cutting, 22% uh, due to harvesting better quality swards, and that's all related to reseeding more off, often, etc. And then there was a whole range of other things, such as just more attention to detail, wilting, better use of slurry, better machinery. Uh, so, given that the farmers that uh, believed quality had improved due to earlier cutting, I believe that was so important. Well, why do farmers not cut earlier? And I think probably part of the answer lies to uh, uh, how farmers pay in terms of contractor use. And bear in mind, I think it was 65% of farmers use a contractor. And you can see that uh, of farmers using contractors, almost 90% paid per acre. And only a very small percentage, probably about 3% either paid per hour or per yield. I think it's important to realise uh, what this isn't saying is that if you're on a multi-cut system, which some farmers are, they're not getting lower rates. This is more just those that are operating a traditional two or three harvest system. And if you go a bit earlier within your three harvest system, you're still pretty much normally paying per acre. So I, I do believe that uh, charging per acre is encouraging farmers to delay cutting. And bear in mind that our survey results indicate that 35% of farmers believed allowing cro uh, crops to bulk up to reduce harvesting costs was having between either a moderate or very large effect on silage quality. So just the whole payment system, I believe, is certainly impacting on uh, silage quality within the north. Interestingly enough, 64% of farmers indicated that they might move to an earlier cutting or a cut earlier if their contractor offered an alternative yield-based charging system. And we know that with technology coming on forage for us now that it is possible. Uh, we're just maybe not sure how accurate some of those are, but it's certainly possible to get a, an estimate of yield. And 
that is something that maybe an alternative charging system uh, in the future might help in terms of signage quality. So uh, really, what is the impact of cutting date? Just two slides to sort of summarize this here. First one is really, what's the impact of a one week delay in harvesting? Well, it's probably a figure that many of you will be familiar with. And uh, that normally we say that for each one week we delay harvesting devalue digestibility or dry matter digestibility, uh, our DOMD falls by about 3.3 uh, percentage units. And we also know there's a real trade off between yield and quality, and that's always a balance. And just deciding when to cut is certainly or can be a challenge sometimes. Obviously, contractors uh, determine that, weather determines that. But I think one of the areas we would probably like to look at in the future maybe is uh, trying to get better markers to be able to predict changes in digestibility. So you can actually go out and look at that sward of grass and have a much better idea of how digestibility is. The, the, the arable farmers do it with their crops. They, they, they really monitor, they know the different stages and maybe we just don't do that to the same extent with grass. And that's maybe an area we would like to try to look at in the future. In terms of the impact of uh, uh, digestibility on cow performance, uh, and this is from a review paper by Tim Kennedy, one silage devalue or DOMD, dry matter increases by dry matter intake increases by about a quarter of a kilo. Uh, milk yield will generally increase by uh, uh, 0.33 of a kilogram and get a, normally get an increase in milk protein as we cut earlier as d-value increases and a bit of a fall in milk fat and uh, sorry these are just going very slow my slides and but one of the key ones here is we can result in a concentrate saving of up to 0.44 kilograms per day uh, with a 1% increase in D-value. So there's a real opportunity to cut back in terms of costs uh, by making uh, a cutting earlier, higher quality silage. Uh, okay, Look, just really moving on to the whole concept of multi-cut systems. As I said earlier, 65% of farmers uh, cut within a three-cut system. And one of the questions we're really asking is, should farmers consider moving to a multi-cut? And when I say multi-cut, I'm really talking about four or more cut systems. And I do realize that uh, some farmers have already gone there, especially more so in GB, maybe where the weather's a little bit more favorable than it is in Northern Ireland. Uh, so really this slide just, uh, if it would come up, is it, sorry, Conrad, is it slow at your side? Because I, I can see it okay now, this side. Okay, sorry, it's just come up now. Okay, so this was an early AFPI study. Uh, it was actually a bit of work I did back in 1998, where we compared a two-cut system with a four-cut system. And obviously much year, lower yielding cows than we have at present. But you can see that with the two systems, and we fed both cuts or all four cuts here, Milk yield really wasn't very different. Uh, we lost a little bit of milk, but if you look at the different amounts of concentrates needed to achieve the same level of performance with the two systems, you can see we needed over double the amount of concentrates with the two cut system compared to the four cut system. Now, I have to admit that at that stage, I guess a lot of farmers are really only moving to three cut systems. So maybe the research wasn't overly uh, applicable at that stage. Plus the fact concentrates were relatively low cost. Uh, and in some ways that, that research was parked until fairly recently. However, we have more recently uh, set up a new study looking at comparing three versus four cut systems. And this was a couple of years ago, the cutting dates within the study are just highlighted in this slide within the three cut system. Uh, we're at end of May, 24th of July and 11th of September. So we're trying to cut here at basically 50, 52 day intervals. We were late cutting here in this study, simply it was a wet spring, it was a slow spring, and that delayed us a little bit. Three in the four cut system. The four cut system, we were at 25th and the, the fourth cut was the same as the cutting dates we used with in the study. 
in terms of, of yields, uh, the slide just hasn't come up yet. Oh, here, here it is. In terms of yields, you can see that uh, in each of three, within the three cut, yields were higher. Uh, the blue bars than the four cut system, the red bars. But we then did have the fourth, uh, the fourth cut. But even with that, yields were still lower with the four cut system. So we lost about a ton of dry matter with the, what I call the multi-cut system. I think that's been fairly consistent in measurements we've taken here at Hillsborough over a number of years, uh, losing between half a ton to one ton as we move from a three to a four cut system. Uh, just in terms of the quality of the silages that we offered uh, within the study, and uh, it's just not come up on my slide, I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, we were, uh, the, the dry matter, I'll just try to, oh yeah, here we have it. The dry matter was fairly similar. We were targeting 30, 35% dry matter, uh, a little bit higher if the four cut, but easier to wilt it. Protein, a uh, couple of percentage points higher with the four cut system, and ME uh, about 0.6 megajoules higher. Probably disappointed in the ME here of the four cut system. Uh, uh, I would probably expect a slightly bigger difference and slightly higher, but those are the figures, and I've seen other similar figures uh, published from GB research as well on four cut systems. In terms of silage intakes, you can see, uh, sorry, sorry, I should say we were operating on a feed to yield system here, so we didn't put the same amount of concentrates in. We were actually feeding according to uh, intakes of silage and the yield of the cow. But you can see silage intakes were higher for the four cut system. We didn't need as much concentrates and total dry matter intake was slightly higher with the four cut system. In terms of performance, we gained an extra two and a half litres of milk with the, two, with the four cut system. Uh, milk fat was reduced a little bit, milk protein increased a little bit and fat plus protein yield, uh, the bottom line there was about 70% higher with the four cut system compared to the three cut system. In terms of economics, I guess the first thing you decide when you're trying to put economics, this sort of thing is, what sort of value do you put on silage made within a three and a four cut system? Now, there's a bit of research done, a bit of work at AFPI, probably almost 20 years ago now, uh, which costed a whole range of forages. So we updated that uh, with new costs, uh, for all the, all the different inputs. And uh, the, these costs here actually include depreciation on silos as well, a depreciation on infrastructure, but not actually feed out. And you can see that the costs that we came up with here were £115 per tonne of dry matter with the three cut system and £137 per tonne of dry matter for the four cut system. And that difference reflects in part the, the, the extra harvest and the lower yield. So in terms of, based on those costs, in terms of silage costs within the study I talked about, uh, based on intakes, you can see costs were slightly higher with the four cut system. The silage itself is more expensive, cows add more of it. Total feed costs were also slightly higher with the four cut system, but the value of milk, we got an extra two and a half litres of milk, and when we took account of the differences in composition, uh, we gained an extra 70 pence in the value of milk there. And the overall effect here was margin per cow uh, was about uh, 45 pence per day higher with the four cut system. Margin per hectare was slightly lower, relaxing the lower yields and requirement. And I'll just come on to this one, uh, not a really important issue. Uh, when I talk to farmers uh, about uh, moving to a multi cut or improving silage quality, one of the comments I often get is, well, I, one year I did make really excellent quality silage, but the cows had so much of it, I ran out by the end of February and maybe hit me off a little bit. So uh, apologies, I appreciate these are probably quite small, but these are really showing the yields that you get when you move from a two, three, four, five cut system. Uh, so really showing you that is more frequently you harvest grass yields go down. And the second slide is really showing, uh, they're quite blurred on my screen, I'm not sure how you're seeing them, but uh, silage intakes go up, the orange bars as you move from a two to three to four to five cut system. So when you combine those lower grass yields with higher silage intakes, the key fact is you need, uh, you, you need a bigger area of land to produce that extra silage. 
And I think just uh, moving from a two to four cut system, you probably needed an extra 20% more land area. So I, I farmers often say, well, that's, a, that's going to be a real challenge. Northern Ireland uh, land is one of our most limiting factors. And certainly getting an extra 15, 20% more land is going to be a big issue. I would probably question maybe that's not the right way to look at it. Uh, the alternative approach is to grow more grass, and this probably leads a little bit into what Philip will talk about. Uh, there was a bit of work here uh, done in the north a couple of years ago by the Sustainable Agriculture and Land Use Strategy, which showed that on average, Northern Ireland dairy farms were utilising about seven and a half tonnes of grass by matter per hectare, utilising that. While we have certainly the potential to probably utilise 12 plus tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So maybe uh, the question is not so much, do we need more land? It's maybe getting more from the land area that we have. And some of the key issues are just highlighted here in red. Less than 10% of our soils in the north have an up-to-date soil test. 64% of soils are not at optimum pH. 40% of soils are below optimum in terms of case status. And 36% of first cut silages suffer sulfur deficiency. So really, when you take that all into account, you can probably realise we could probably grow a lot more grass here, and we could utilise a lot more of it. And probably one of the key things is to really get back to basics in terms of getting soil nutrient management sorted. I just want to finish off just with three slides on the dangers of silage making because I, I do think it's an opportunity to highlight it. And th this slide really is just, uh, the, uh, the, these couple of slides are based on a paper that was published in a scientific journal called Journal of Dairy Science. And I think you can probably find this paper if you just Google the title. Uh, it's, uh, from a, it's an American uh, paper by an American author called Keith Bolson from the University or Kansas State University. And um, really within the, the paper, the author deals with a series of case studies on accidents that have happened uh, during silage making, predominantly uh, within the States. And he listed six hazards, uh, tractor rolling over, entanglement in machinery, falling from heights, which I'll not say anything about all, fairly obvious. But hazards for over five and six, number four was being crushed by an avalanche or collapsing silage. Hazard number five was dangers of silage gases, and hazard number six was complacency and fatigue. And I'll just deal with number six just in this slide without moving on. Uh, if, uh, my next few bits will pop up. Uh, uh, hopefully these are going to come. Well, complacency and fatigue. Uh, one of the case studies featured a man who lost three fingers in silage making machinery. And the quote was, I was mentally tired, I was physically worn out, and I was in a hurry. And I guess that probably summarises uh, silage making weather on a lot of farms uh, uh, in GB in Ireland. But maybe the surprising thing here, or the bit that hit me, was the statement was actually made by the author of the paper, Professor Keith Bolson, uh, who did actually lose uh, part of his hand in that silage making accident. So. Uh, being mentally tired, physically worn out, and in a hurry, a real recipe for uh, accidents to take place. Number four, just briefly, hazards being crushed by an avalanche, and these are photos from uh, the, the United States. Obviously, uh, silos in the US are much larger than they are here. Maize silage is much more common, which can collapse more often. But if we bear in mind our silos are getting larger all the time, if I look around some of the large farms in Northern Ireland, there are some very large silos there. And while maize is probably the greater risk, it's not only maize. This is a photograph taken at a silo in Hillsborough a couple of years ago, where probably 60 to 70 tonnes of silage uh, slipped forward by about two foot within the silo one day. Uh, so the risk is not just with maize silage growth, Grass silage can move as well, uh, especially if you've undercut it with uh, when you're taking out blocks. So just the danger of going in at the bottom there, taking samples, uh, there is a real issue there. The final one I just want to talk about here is silage gases. And I, I highlight this because probably until I read this paper, I, it's an area I was totally in ignorance of. During the silage fermentation process, the breaking down of nutrients 
gave off lots of different gases, the bacteria that are active there, one of which is nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide uh, changes to nitrogen dioxide when it's in contact with oxygen. Nitrogen dioxide, NO2, is a reddish orange, yellow, brown colored gas. Hairy than air, it smells like laundry bleach. Uh, that's the description of it in the paper. But this is the scary bit. When inhaled and dissolves in the moisture on the internal lung surf surface, it forms nitric acid. And that nitric acid can burn the pulmonary membrane, basically the inside of the lungs, and stop the supply of oxygen to the body. It results in a burning sensation in the nose, throat, chest, and can cause permanent lung damage and ultimately pneumonia and a very high concentration of death. The reason I sort of highlight it uh, is the fact that about 10 years ago, a farmer that I was friendly with sent us in a photograph he had taken on his phone of his own silo pit after he'd sealed it up. And down one side of the pit, there was very obvious this orange yellowy gas coming out of the pit. And at that stage, he didn't know what it was and we had no idea what it was. No one was injured and uh, there was no harm to anyone. But that's what it was. It was nitrogen dioxide and under different circumstances, somebody potentially could have been very badly uh, injured. So it is sort of a real risk. I'm just going to finish off there. Uh, I appreciate time is probably mostly just aren't coming up. Uh, but uh, there they are. I'm not, I'm not going to come to it just in the time. Again, say thank you very much for your attention. And I'm just going to hand over to Philip to uh, say his bit on nutrient management in grassland. Over to Philip. Thanks, Conrad. And good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to. Unusually, I'm going to talk about um, something that we, we, we as, as agronomists and farmers, we, we, we think of the measurement of success as being the yield of a, of a crop and, um, you know, the cost of producing that crop. But in the last number of years, um, there's been more focus, not just on the, the, the economics of growing crops and, 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 um, and how crops yield and maximise the potential yield, but actually there's a... Um, a new measurement is coming into place here where, where you know, how efficient, how efficient are we using the resources that go into producing the crop? And therefore, I suppose this term of nitrogen use efficiency has sprung up in the last number of years. And I guess in this presentation, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about nitrogen use efficiency within a whole livestock system or within a whole dairy system, you know, from, from um, you know, from manure storage, um, and, and obviously the, the diet of, 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 of cows has an impact on, on the actual um, on nitrogen use efficiency, the whole farm nitrogen use efficiency. But from, from this perspective, it's from a crop. And this is something that Yara has been always very vocal on, is that you know, we should be looking at, at how effective when we apply nitrogen, how much of that is actually coming back in the crop you know, and, and measuring that. Um, so this is looking from the pot. This is looking from when that actual nitrogen, um, it's, it's what nitrogen applications we're applying onto our, for example, a first cut silage crop. So the objective is to minimise nitrogen and, and also phosphorus loss, for that matter, to the environment, but then also grow a crop cost effectively. So generally, when we're talking about nitrogen losses and how we tighten that circle and minimise the, the 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 potential losses. You know, leaching is, is, is probably the, the area where most nitrogen is lost, followed then by ammonia, but that's very particular to the type of, of uh, the amount of organic manures and the type of organic manures and how they're applied or, 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 or utilised, um, but also um, the type of mineral fertiliser that's been used. And then the third one, um, and it's, it's um, noteworthy, is, is nitrous oxide. N2O is a very potent greenhouse gas. And this is... Um, obviously, in the context of you know how it, what effect the loss of that, how it might affect or, or reduce potential yields. Um, it's not something that's going to affect potential yields, but it is. Um, it has a, as a, as a an impact on the environment. A very, I suppose, um, as a as a greenhouse gas, it's a very important greenhouse gas. So there's 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 management practices can influence can influence 
nitrogen use efficiency on farm. And I'm not going to cover them all here this evening. Um, Conrad um, touched on a number on a number of them there, and, and from from the type of um, on on I suppose practices around about harvest time, maybe a multi-cut system where whether more to in comparison to traditional, maybe two or three cut systems, and also um, sward compositions and whether it's a new lay with with um, a lot of the sown species still in it, or whether it's an old um, lay where there's many um, meadow grasses in it. And, and they, you know, we can't uh, look at their requirement for nutrients in the same, they, they can't all have the same nutrient requirements because they don't, they have different genetic potential to grow those diff different um different different swords of different comp, comp species composition and and the next part of i suppose nitrogen use fishing and closing in on this loop is is the use of analysis the analysis the use of, of soil analysis but also crop material analysis and and that's key to maximizing nitrogen use efficiency and our colleagues in in land crop both john and caroline you know this is something that they have a lot of um you know uh, i suppose experience and have a lot of information that they can share in, you know, you know, what are the averages throughout, whether it's looking at Northern Ireland, you know, Scotland, England, Wales, or the Republic of Ireland, and what, you know, what is the state of soil fertility in those different areas? And I suppose if we if we want to calculate nitrogen use efficiency, pretty much it's what it's the amount of nitrogen in the in the crop that we harvest, and um, divided by the available nitrogen that was applied in it. So if we're applying 100 and um, 20 kgs of total nitrogen in the form of, of available nitrogen, organic manures, um, and also mineral nitrogen. If we're applying, so a total of 120 kgs, which is a typical first uh, cut um, uh, nitrogen requirement. And for example, then you harvest then if that crop material then is five tons of dry matter and it's a 2%, you know, you can then work out what the actual, um, get a percentage of that and that gives you your nitrogen use efficiency. So, you know, for that, particular calculation, I think it works out at around about maybe 83%. So that would be considered a very good nitrogen use efficiency, but they do vary, but there is scope, um, you know, and there's many factors involved and it's about attention to detail as, as Conrad, I think, mentioned earlier on as well to, to, to nutrient management. And the fundamentals, you, you'll, you, you'll probably all have seen these two um, figures um, and these are fundamental to nitrogen use efficiency and that soil pH, and we can see there if we you if we keep our soils um, within that optimum range, you know it maximizes the availability availability of those not just the major nutrients or the primary or secondary nutrients, but also those micronutrients. And then Liebig barrel, you know if we're going to use that nitrogen effectively, well then we can't have um, other nutrients that are that are possibly limiting that um, that that limiting the, the, the uptake of that nitrogen that we've just applied. So, you know, what comes to mind is phosphorus and potassium and sulfur, but they're, it's, they're not um, the only ones, but they're the main ones that kind of spring to mind. So any deficiency of a single nutrient is enough to limit yield. So that's something we must bear in mind. And that goes back to um, soil analysis and, and a very effective tool. So if we look at soil pH, I know in, in, in Northern Ireland and in, in, in GB, the optimum soil pH is just above a pH of six, but um, it's probably in more intensive, intensively stocked farms that are pushing productivity. Um, it's probably worth actually considering that a, an optimum pH in, in grassland is more like that six between 6.3 and, and 6.5, 6.7. That that that's the the, um, the 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 range in which you're going to optimize grass production or optimize the 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 um, you all applied nutrients and that's very basic soil pH is, is, is really a fundamental aspect of, of nitrogen use efficiency. The next slide is on soil phosphate. Our, our soil index system, whether you're looking at this, this is the, the, the UK system, but if you're listening from, from the Republic of Ireland, you know, the, the, the I suppose index system is very good at, 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 at determining and whether our soil has sufficient levels of a nutrient or whether it's, it's got a, um, it's, it's oversupplied with a nutrient or it's undersupplied with a nutrient. You know, if we look at, at I suppose, um, you know, how, how things have moved on, we know about these, about, um, you know, these, this index system for a long time now, and it's a very eff effective approach um, to, to using nutrients efficiently for grass production. 
we can see there that index two is that is that optimum index um, on on for on grassland, and we can see there that as the, as the trend line just levels off, that's that comes into that. Um, you know, if you look between 15 and, and, and 24 milligrams um, of, of, um, of P. So that's where we would like to see our soils, not over, not, not in the high levels, particularly not on four, but not on zero or one either. So I suppose the second nutrient is very important, the nutrient for, for first cut, for, for silage um, in particular, is, is potash. We can see in this graph on the right hand side where the, the dark blue, um, columns are on index zero soils, at, at, so at, at low index K, and the light blue then are for soils at index one. So still not optimum index for K, which is two minus, but it's, um, it's still, it's still uh, higher K fertility than, than index zero. But you can see there the application. So we're taking around about 100, if we were talking about a five, K, a five ton of dry matter crop of first cut, you know, your, your, your off takes are around about 165 kgs per hectare and that, and that's of, of um, K2O, not elemental K, but of K2O. So you can see there, I just circled in, in, in red there, you know, at 150 kgs, it's, it's not quite 165 kgs, but you can see there the benefit of, of having your soils at index one in comparison to zero. And we, you know, in that particular trial, the same amount of nitrogen was used um, on all those cuts that made up that um, total yield. So you can see then how how we can improve that nitrogen use or improve nitrogen uptake by by the crop we're growing. And some other points there on luxury uptake, we would try and not have more than 80 or 90 kgs of, of, of K2O applied um, from the 1st of March onwards. And obviously excessive potassium, it has that issue with luxury uptake and the effect on on, um, on uh, close cows, close cows close to calving and milk fevers, but potassium on, on in general, um, it doesn't have a, uh, have a, uh, an impact on grass uh, silage and silability or quality. So sulfur is, is, the, is, the, is the last nutrient I'm just going to discuss here. And at Yara, we, we, we kind of promote a little and often approach. Um, we're seeing increased yields of been 10 and 20%. We've just from what Conrad's presentation, we can see that there's a significant number of of um, um, samples coming into uh, the labs in Northern Ireland where sulfur is, is deficient in first cuts or in, in silage samples. But you know, if we assume that, that the sulfur in um, grass is at 0.25% in the, in the dry matter, and each ton of dry matter then contains 6.2 kgs of, of, of sulfate or SO3, of, of SO3. Um, so we can see if we have a five or six ton crop um, you can see the amount of um, SO3 that's been off take, it's been taken off. And the national recommendations in general are, are at 40 kgs of SO3 per, particularly for first cuts, and they can be scaled back slightly then for, for second and subsequent cuts as um, obviously mineralized sulfur comes in more into play, but also um, you haven't got, uh, there's a, a reduction in, in, in subsequent yields, so the, the requirement isn't as high. So we know soil, Sulfate, sulfur, the plant takes up sulfur in sulfate form, so it's leachable. So over the winter, um, a lot of the available sulfur is going to be leached down out of the, um, out of, I suppose, uh, the root zone, the grass root zone. So it's important even on first cuts and in, for that matter, grazing, those first applications receive um, some sulfur, but it's not mobile in the plant. So therefore, the, the, the actual plant, I suppose, needs um, access to sulfur throughout the growing period. And, and so there is sulfur in, in, in slurry, but much of it is tied up in the organic matter and it takes a while for that to actually uh, mineralize. So um, we have to, to look at, at, at supplementing sulfur in our, in our mineral fertilizer. Um, move swiftly on now to looking at, you know, we, we don't want to get caught up on just the nutrients and soil pH. There are other, I suppose, things that we need to um, be mindful of, and this, I suppose, with regards to soil compaction, and this was a, a trial done by Paul Car Hargreaves at, at the SRUC in, 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 in the Crichton in, in Scotland. Um, and it was, it was also um, another uh, trial was carried out in Harper Adams at the same time. But we're looking at, you know, re yield reduction. There was two treatments. There was one that had um, all silage operations were con controlled traffic. So 
all wheelings were on were contained in the same um, tram lines throughout all five cuts. Um, and then there was that, you know, per normal where you're taking five cuts and, and tractors are driving willy nilly across the field, whether it's bring whether si empty silage trailers coming across to meet the harvester or leaving the silage harvester full going to going to leave the field through a, a gate. So we can see that where we where the controlled traffic farming um, was practiced, we can see that um, versus the, the trampled area where there was tractor, there was no restriction on tractor movements, um, where, where there was no restriction on tractor movements, um, there was uh, in the first year of that trial, um, there was a 0.3 k, 3 tonne of a hectare dry matter reduction in yield. And you can see there um, how that increased over the three years to 2014, where it ended up there was a, a two tonne reduction and an accumulated yield loss of 3.3 .3 tonnes. So that again is 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 basically, um, uh, I suppose, decreasing nutrient nitrogen use efficiency and nutrient use efficiency for that matter and the other nutrients too. And it's also, I suppose, important to note that the the area that there was no um, control in where the the tractor and, and machinery moved, that area had 62% greater N2O emissions from that area than um, the area that, that had controlled traffic farming practice on it. So that's another, um, um, I suppose, thing to be mindful of, that it's not just a nutrient aspect, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, we must look at this thing in a holistic approach where we're looking at soil health as well. Um, and, and that's just some of the results from the soil compaction from how they moved from 2011 to 2014. So the bottom um, results there where there was no compaction, the bulk density was one, pretty much one, one gram per centimetres cubed at the very start of it. And it was pretty much the same, was actually lower by the end of it. But in the, the, the area that had the, um, that there was no restriction in tractor movements, you can see the way the bulk density has increased. So bulk density is a measure of compaction in that top. Um, 10 centimetres. The next thing is slurry and our use of slurry. Um, you know, through, through policy and, and legislation now we're being, um, you know, there's a requirement now to use low emission spreading systems. They are um, a positive, you know, phosphorus and potassium are a different matter, but for regard for nitrogen, for improving nitrogen use efficiency from slurries and keeping more of that available nitrogen in our slurry in the ground so that it can be taken up by the plant. Um, they're definitely um, a bonus. And we can see there from that slide, I hope you can see it um, on the left hand side. And um, you can see from spring applied, obviously colder temperatures. And generally in spring, we see um, even where we apply nutrients um, in springtime by splash plate, um, that basically more of that available N is being kept in the ground. But you can see that there's, there's 2.4 units more of N by using, splat, by using um, low emission spreading systems in the spring in comparison to using, say, splash bit, the traditional system in, in, in spring. And that is then maintained then as you go, in, go into, um, into summer. Obviously, as you go into summer, it's warmer, and that then has a, um, that has, um, increases the risk of, of, of ammonia volatilization. Um, but that's, all those values are referenced from RB209. And also, um, it's important to note that, I suppose we, we keep that, um, that when we use trailing shoe, it allows us maybe to, I suppose, um, spoil grass as well, as particularly on, 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 on silage systems. And nitrogen type, um, it, you know, we need to be mindful of the nitrogen that we're using, whether it's urea, whether it's, um, or, you know, uh, calcium ammonium nitrate or can, or from GB, um, you, you know, you, you're using ammonium nitrate. So it's important that if you're using urea that you're timing it with, with, with weather and that you know, you're getting some rain after you apply it to minimize um, nitrogen or ammonia volatilization and therefore nitrogen loss. So we can see there from that um, NT26 work um, that you, know, you can have significant losses of ammonia um, from of, of, of the total N applied. So 30% of total N applied. And it was important to add that during this study, the highest ammonia losses were from, from, that were, were seen from urea in February. And then by the use of urea with inhibitor, we significantly reduce ammonia losses. But the lowest losses of all are, are with ammonium nitrate and, and, and CAN. CAN wasn't used in that particular project, but um, 
CEM would have actually lower ammonia losses. So using the, the correct nitrogen type, and if we are using urea, that we you know we take into account that um, it's possible that we are going to have high losses, and so maybe uh, time it around about um, you know when it's possible to get two or three millimeters of rain after straight after application or within 24 hours. Fertilizer quality, um, we can see from Yara's own products, we have true. Um, um, you know, complex compounds or true uniform compounds. So, you know, we, we do all the other things right, but it's important whether you use a blended fertilizer or you're using a Yara product, a compound, a quality fertilizer that, you know, that they are, that we're looking at the, the landing spots, I suppose, for individual nutrients. So if you look at comparable, um, a product like Silage Booster with a comparable blended um, silage product, you know, we're, we have 10 times more landing sites for for phosphorus when we use a compound versus a blend. So that's important to note, you know, the, the blend, blend uses a very concentrated uh, more, uh, phosphorus source, so it doesn't need to have as many of those individual particles. So when you think of it, there's a, a number of four, three or 400 plants per meter squared, so it's important to feed that plant, and it's no good if that phosphorus lands if you're using an NPKS product, you know, if it lands um, 15 centimeters away from, um, from a plant, it, it won't be able to avail of that. Of that of that phosphorus, and particularly for for sulfur as well. So if we go on, um, and it's also important to note that that fertilizer then is applied evenly, so that your your fertilizer um, spreader is calibrated and is maintained correctly. Anyway, when you use the correct setting, but also do a tray test um, to make sure that that setting is correct for your spreader. And and finally, first call recommendations. There are, are you could you know there's. Uh, many different um, scenarios that have come up with here, but if you're looking at a typical of 3,000 gallons of, of cattle slurry or 27 meters cubed per hectare using low emission spreading technique or systems like a, a trailing shoe with P and K index of a UK P and K index of, of, of two. So your slurry will, will, will um, effectively give you 34 kgs of N, 40 kgs of P, 83 kgs of K and 10 kgs of sulfur. So to balance that using RB209 recommendations, our fertilizer required would be, we need 88, 86 kgs of nitrogen. So this is just a typical nutrient management plan for a field. We have the soil analysis. We know how much slurry we're putting on. It would be helpful if that slurry was analyzed in a lab like in land crop so that we knew exactly what was in it so we could tailor this mineral fertilizer requirement to that. But in this scenario here, a product like Yara Bella Axan, it's a can-based product, 27% nitrogen, 9% SO3 at 319 kgs per hectare. So that's giving that crop, you know, we're not under applying nutrients or we're not over applying nutrients and there's enough sulfur there to help um, optimize nitrogen uptake as well. So just finally, um, I know I'm probably running over here a bit. So um, optimize NU, to optimize nitrogen use efficiency requires a focus on a range of management practices that I haven't, you know, we haven't discussed them all here. You know, efficient use of nitrogen requires regular analysis, you know, measure to manage, that's the mantra we like to, 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 um, to, to say. Um, and also, you know, manage soil fertility and nutrient applications. Don't be passive and don't um, get a soil analysis and then don't go the whole way and actually then using that to come up with a bespoke uh, nutrient um, program for each individual field or group a number of fields with the same uh, cropping, same um, soil fertility, etc. So thank you very much and uh, good evening. So the first question that came in um, was on multi-cut systems that, he's, that this person is interested to know uh, the time needed between fertilizer applications and cutting. In, in general, to answer that, in general, um, first cuts tend to have, um, there's, there's no issue obviously with, 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 with first cuts, but um, with second cuts, um, some farmers are using RB209 recommendations. There are others kind of using their own from that they've been, you know, experience um, has, has dictated what, um, what the, the, the rates of fertilizer and obviously organic nutrients they're applying um after uh, the harvest and before the subsequent cut um, and and it's still very hard to um i suppose that the main thing there is to to get fertilizer out um to apply organic manures first as soon as as the harvest is complete and then to leave um four or five days after organic manures have been uh, applied 
um, and to go on with the mineral fertilizer then. Two units or two and a half kgs per day is still um, a rule of thumb, a pretty accurate rule of thumb for that, and that would include the available nitrogen, the organic manures you're applied. If you, are, if, you're, if, you don't, if you don't have access or there's no organic manures being applied, well then we would, um, the mineral fertilizer then would need to go out um, you know, immediately after um, the previous harvest. But if that two units a day is still a kind of a rule of thumb, and I guess the length of time is pretty much up to the farmer and the and the conditions of the um, that if you're operating, if you if you plan to do a five cuts or four cuts, that will then determine uh, the length, you know, the, the the period of time. And obviously, then if it's if it's a, a forty day defoliation period, well then um, you know you go with um, you know eighty units in total, including the organic manures. And that may be a little bit different than uh, RB209. And generally, you would then scale that back slightly then um, in subsequent cuts, so on the fourth and fifth cuts. Um, there's some questions here on protected urea. Um, Yara do have uh, protected urea available in, in Ireland, in both the Republic of Ireland and in Northern Ireland. Um, and that's an NBPT-based um, urea inhibitor. Um, Another question regarding to the options of protected urea with other trace elements and selenium. We don't have a we do, we we are we haven't got um, uh, one of those products that is including trace elements or, or, or you know for example selenium. Um, there is an issue with um, including other nutrients along with urea and in the stability of the inhibitor, and, and obviously the shelf life then is going to be affected. That if we if we use sulfur. Like um, in, in in products like ammonium sulfate, or we use um, sodium selenate, or and sodium selenate is what we use, but others would use sodium selenite. They are salts, and basically similar to phosphate salts, um, that that really has a, a negative impact on the stability of the inhibitor, so it reduces the the shelf life of the product. Um, um, then if we kind of, there's another question that's come in here on um, do fertilizer applications have um, have a have a, an effect on performance and, long, and longevity of more diverse lays, um, including clover lays? They, they do, um, and obviously nitrogen is the one thing that, that may not, does have to be considered separately, but for the other nutrients, for phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, um, you know they have a, the optimum. They have a um, if you want to optimize um, their performance and longevity, and um, particularly clover, um, it's important to have uh, a soil pH of in around about 6.3 to 6.5, and maintain good levels. And um, you know index twos for both P and K. And clover is particularly sensitive to, to potash um, deficiency. So for fertilizer, for nitrogen. Yes, a lot of these product, these diverse layers have been used to, to lower fertilizer, the lower fertilizer requirement, particularly the ones that are clover. But work has been done here in, in Chagas down in Moor Park has shown that the nitrogen applications have a place on clover swards, particularly for grazing in that you know spring period up to May, um, where they've reduced uh, mineral fertilizer applications from 250 kgs of N down to 150 kgs of N on, on clover uh, swards with a, that are that have probably 25, 20 to 30 percent um, clover content. So there is still there. So you're applying nitrogen when the actual clover plant hasn't quite woken up yet. And it doesn't seem to, it has a, a positive effect on clover then going into the end of May period where clover then takes over and fixes nitrogen. Um, just another question there was on pros and cons of multi-species swards. I'm very conscious now of, of the time we're, we're going over nine o'clock. Pros and cons of multi-species swards. Um, they're, they're definitely, there's a lot of work being going into these swards at the moment, and they do seem to have a huge potential um, to reduce, particularly, um, you know, that are, they're, they're, um, they, they, they have benefits with regards to their um, during periods of, of, of drought, that they can still, um, you know, produce more than a, than a typical perennial ryegrass only sward. That has many advantages, um, but they, you know, I suppose one of the biggest con, the 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 drawbacks for multi-species swards are um, the control of weeds, weed species, and that that is an issue. But there is, um, I think there are 
Conrad had mentioned that there are two webinars um, at the end of this month, I think, on um, multi-species swords. I think it's, um, and I didn't hear who was actually providing those webinars or, or, or running those app webinars, but um, we can- well, uh, Sorry, apologies. I just managed to get back in. Uh, yeah, it's, it's British Society of Animal Science, BSAS. Uh, two webinars, I think it's the 26th of January and the 2nd of February uh, on multi-species swords, that whole area. So I think if you just go to the British Society of Animal Science website, you could probably get that information there. Apologies. Thanks, Conrad. Um, glad you could, you're, you, you've, you've, you're back. <laughs> back <in. laughs> um, just another question came in with, uh, it's always one for this time of the year, um, is the T sum used to calculate early nitrogen? Um, there, this had been used in the past on, on grassland, um, but it, it kind of has fallen out of favour. The T sum is pretty much from the 1st of January, you calculate the average air temperatures from the 1st of January. And when, as you add that, and as it, as it, as it reaches a total of, of 200, you know, that was the, the, the point at which you were, which was the, the time to apply that first nitrogen application. But um, it's, it's not particularly um, helpful. Sometimes it works um, that it's accurate, but a lot of the time, I think that we've fallen back for, and the actual average temperature is basically taken from the max um, in that 24 hour and the, min in, the minimum temperature in that 24 hour period, and it's the average, so it's divided by two. So that's the actual um, average um, um, air temperature that, that's used. But yeah, it's basically, I think what, what pretty much everyone has kind of moved to looking at soil temperatures and conditions. Um, you know, most farmers know when traditionally when grass might, in, from, from experience, when grass would tend to start growing. So it's looking at, you know, farmers getting soil temperatures, thermometers and looking, um, you know, on their own farm when, you know, is that period when soil temperatures to a depth of 10 centimetres have re reached, you know, five to, six, five to six degrees Celsius and are kind of rising and soil conditions are good, that soils are not waterlogged. That's something that the T-sum can't help you with. You know that soil conditions can be very poo poor. So there's a certain amount of common sense, you know, and, and maybe appear, uh, uh, areas of the farm can be applied as, as, um, earlier than others, you know, drier parts of the farm. Um, but like, you know, soil temperature is important and um, covers that have been that are there from the previous years. If you're if you're managing, uh, if you have an autumn rotation, and you're you're carrying covers over. That's obviously important to note as well. Um, but it's you know it's common sense a lot of times. But this soil temperatures is 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 kind of the one that we would like to use more now. And obviously, uh, medium to, to to short term forecasting as well. That there's not um, a weather event, a severe weather event on the horizon. Um, so I think that's pretty much all of the, the pre-registration um, questions that came in. There, I, I, there, there, I think are, are questions that came in um, during the actual webinar. And what we will do, I think we, we don't want to run over any more than we have. Um, and I will get back then either if I think it's a question that Conrad can answer, I will ask Conrad maybe if he, if he wouldn't, if he, if he would oblige. Otherwise, I'll, we will, we will get back to them with um, an answer, but I think it's time to finish up this. And just finally, um, just on the Yara reward scheme, if you're in, if you're if you buy Yara fertilizer, um, you know we have a reward scheme going where if you buy, say, one of the booster products, which is our range of a specific range of grassland fertilizers, um, which are fortified with selenium. So if you buy those products, you can then reclaim points um, that can be exchanged for gifts or um, practical um, on-farm um, things like uh, tray tests and also the, the, the big bag knife, which is a very popular one on farms. So if you get, um, or sorry, if you buy a product like Yara Meal Silage Booster, you get 30 points for every ton that you buy, um, and Yara Bella Neutral Booster is 25 points. And there's, if, if you go onto yara.co.uk or yara.ie, you can um, register um, for that reward scheme and you can also uplay, upload your, your uh, delivery notes anyway to get those points, to, to be credited for those um, points from the Yara products that you've, that you've purchased. Um, and that's, and that's um, you know, I'd like to finish up now. And it's a pity now Eva um, isn't able to, because she normally does this part of the, the webinar.
But thank you very much, everyone, for um, for logging on this evening and listening. And we hope you um, found it beneficial for um, for yourselves. Um, and I'd also like to thank Conrad again for his for his time um, and his expertise this evening, which I think was a very interesting um, set of slides that he that he presented earlier on. So, good evening, everyone, and um, please please stay safe. Thank you. Bye bye.